Hi there, welcome to Design Spark. Today I'm joined by Pete Wood of Design Spark. Hi Pete, would you like to say hello? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi Greg. Uh, I'm Pete Wood and I head up the Design Spark experience team. So that's everything that's kind of customer facing, supplier facing, partner facing on the platform. And uh, I've been with the team now for this is my 11th year. Great, fantastic. So quite some time then. So Pete, we're seeing a lot around activist engineering on, on Design Spark. Could you just give us a little bit more about what exactly is that? What, what, what you positioning around activist engineering? Is it about engineering responsibility, engineering with regards to maybe climate change and the environment, or is it all of that? So I guess activist engineering is quite a wide term. I guess the way I like to describe it is it is about engineering responsibility. So it's actually connected to the RS group's agenda around ESG or environmental social governance, if you like. So the part that to engineers play in, in an ESG for business is huge. Uh, if you look at it in terms of products and technology, so engineers are designing products, those products ultimately will end up in a landfill. So, you know, there's a responsibility there to, you know, for engineers to be, you know, make better decisions about the components they choose, how they design things so they're more, you know, uh, less power consumption, uh, you know, things that are more repairable, that, that kind of thing. So we're kind of, you know, looking at how we can help influence and educate and work with engineers to become you know, more responsible design engineers. And that would be in terms of not only protecting the planet and helping, you know, um, the problems we've got with climate change, et cetera, but also the lives of people. So how that impacts yeah. the lives of people, uh, whether they've got, you know, disabilities or requirements or medical issues, you know, how, how do you help people in that respect as well? So it's quite a wide remit. I think kind of the main thing to say is when we talk about activism, it's about taking to the workshops, not to the streets, right? So we're not encouraging engineers to, Know, go out and protest etc you know really what it's all about is how do you use your engineering skills you know to you know engineer a better world that's really what it's all about so this is why we've kind of latched onto this activist engineering theme to you know support design engineers on their journey really to help them through yeah. you know that learning curve um doesn't matter whether they're you know a young engineer you know just starting out at university or early in their career or whether you know they're more seasoned engineers who have been on a journey for some time you know about helping them adapt to the new ways of you know designing and, and researching the products of these fantastic so as you said one of that areas that you're talking about there is around raising awareness so design yeah. spark obviously a big platform of engineers worldwide one of the things that you guys have done has been the air quality project so what was the idea behind that and what were you hoping to achieve so the whole concept, I guess, around air quality project was about how to could we create a project that kind of started to build on the idea of activist engineering and engage the community. So we've currently got mm -hmm. a 1.3 million members, I think, on the platform globally, you know, uh, from around the world, primarily design engineers, um, of various uh, disciplines uh, and the markets that they serve or the products and technologies that you know they 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 uh, design. So we want to, you know. Um, get into a position where we can support those design engineers and how do we sort of kick this project off how do we drive you know interest and awareness and collaboration i think and the reason yeah. why we sort of look at air quality first is because it's an, a common problem across the world so it's not just limited to you know third world countries but also here in the first world you know air quality is a massive massive issue especially you know in cities like london near where i am you know where they're saying you know 90 percent of you know the air is unfit to breathe if you like so this raises a big concern and also we look at in fact if you're an engineer and you're in a workshop for example and you're designing and 3d printing and soldering and doing all these things you know it's about indoor air quality as well so we wanted to look at how the impact of indoor air quality can affect your your health as well which actually turns out to be as big a problem as outdoor air quality with all the things that you're generating through volatile organic compounds and um yeah. particular matter and all that kind of stuff you know and not just limited to the workshops you think about where you live and work you know you've got heating sources and you've got um um aerosols and cleaning products and all these things all these are nasties that you're breathing in and in a lab environment potentially even more so we want to sort of get a project together to try and understand what you know the potential extent of the problem is where you live and work and then get those users to deploy these kits we put together which we'll go into a bit more in a minute but which connect up to the cloud measure data and then understand the problem that you've got and then based on the results that you're seeing how do you then create a solution uh, or do something uh, from an activist point of view you know to solve yeah. that problem so and that could be as simple as opening a window 
It could be lobbying in the government because there's a challenge because you're working next door to you know, steelworks or something and it's kicking out loads of particulates. Or it might be you're designing something, um, a product or technology that allows you to tackle that problem. So that's why we did it. And we wanted those engineers to share and engage with us on the platform to talk about what they've done and what they found uh, and interact with us and other members as well. So start to try and build that sort of community aspect. So it really is kind of this sort of kickoff project, if you like, uh, to sort of get yeah. the momentum going around the subject. That's really great because um, what you're talking about there with, with air quality, like you say, worldwide, it's, um, it affects everybody equally or disproportionately depending on, on where you live. And what you're saying about the outdoor air quality affecting the indoor air quality, but also indoor air quality being affected by the working environment is probably something, you know, which is unique to all of us because we're all in different environments when we're, we're indoors. So just tell me a little bit about the the kit, uh, the ESD kit, so your um, environmental sensor development kit. What are we talking about in terms of sensors? Are we talking connectivity? Are we talking data? Yeah, so I, I, I guess this is it here. Um, and it, it's basically a kit that we put together that is based on uh, a Raspberry Pi single board computer. Uh, it has an LCD screen and we've got a bunch of sensors that we've connected here in like an array, if you like. Um, we've got um, particular matter, we've got CO2s and VOCs, and there's temperature and humidity on there, for example. And this yeah. is cloud connected as well. So and what it does is it basically detects the levels in real time on here and can give you an, an immediate alert of what the conditions are where you're, where you're living or working. And then that data is then sent up to a cloud platform, which is based on the Grafana platform. And that data we can then share across the community and anyone who wants to see it. And uh, yeah, these kits have kind of been like a, a tool, if you like, to sort of get people going. And uh, they've, uh, you know, it's something we're designing in an open source capacity. So right now we produce 50 kits that we're giving out to the community and ask them to say, hey, I'd like one of these kits because I've got, um, you know, potential challenge around a certain air quality problem that I'd like to understand. And so they've requested the kits and the best ones we've given them out. And they've come back and they've told us what they're doing and they've shared their data. And actually, we've run a competition as well. And we've got some competition winners coming up as well that we can uh, we can talk about later. But yeah, so that's kind of the philosophy behind the kit. And the fact that we can add on new sensors as well, uh, they're all based on, at the moment, Sensorium based sensors. Um, they're accurate to a sense that we're not scientifically accurate, but they're good enough to show the trend. Right. So the hard yeah. idea of this is like, how do you show changing patterns of air quality? Uh, and as you can see here, the CO2 is a really interesting one. Um, CO2 is, you know, obviously we're exhaling CO2 all the time. And I'm shutting my little office here today and it's chilly outside. So all the windows are shut and the doors shut. shut. And the more I'm going to speak, the more those CO2 levels are climbing. And actually that starts to, you know, cognitively, you know, affect your brain yeah. and your thoughts and you feel tired. And a bit like when you're in the car, you know, when you're driving along, you start to feel tired. And that's generally because there's not enough air new air changing in, in there, for example. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think it's got oh, I've been driving too long. Well, yes, it is, but actually it's because <laughs> the CO2 levels are starting to climb up in the cabin. And I think, I think you'll find actually in a lot of uh, more modern cars now as well, they actually put CO2 sensors in there as well to alert you of that. So so this kit, it really is an enabler and it's a tool, a bit like a Swiss Army knife in effect, right? <laughs> we've got it so that you can plug in and out different sensors. We've designed a radiation sensor now. and We've designed uh, NO2 and other things to add on top right okay um, and yeah. you know so you're it, it is an environment detector you know not just air quality so it will detect the environment around you and say all that data can be collected sent to the cloud analyzed shared etc and ultimately what we'd like to do beyond this sort of 50 beta is if we can either i don't know sell the product at some point or we introduce some other products that uh engineers can connect to the cloud we can build up this massive database you know of, of air quality data from around the world. Um, yeah. One one is quite interesting is Hackspaces. Hackspaces are makerspaces, which is probably quite relevant to some other audience out there. You know, how clean is your Hackspace? You know, there's a lot of stuff going on at Hackspaces from 3D printing and laser cutting and all these things that, you know, and gluing and all this stuff that chucks out particulates and volatile organic compounds, um, you know, can be pretty health and, you know, unhealthy hazardous places. Some people have got radiation uh, challenges, I guess, if you're looking at, if you've got like, um, X-ray machines to X-ray stuff. You know, if you're if you're doing homebrew PCB and you're trying to do full grid array kind of products and sit and solve that by hand, you need like an X-ray to see to see whether they've actually you know <laughs> clamped down properly or whatever. So all those sort of things. So uh, I think that's um, 
what we're trying to do really is drive people to use this kit to find the problems that they've got in where they live and work and then you know ultimately solve the problem somehow you know that's the activist mm -hmm. piece great so as you mentioned you, you you've opened this out to the community so you've got 50 beta testers but there was a piece before that where you you got some influencers involved yeah. um some technology people some inventors some creative people tell me a little bit more about those very first projects that you guys had and i, and I believe some of them have actually been put forward for some awards as well is that right that's right yeah so to sort of kick the project off and inspire the community uh, to sort of request these kits we we work with I think it was 12 in the end, sort of 12 influences, if you like. And um, we initially worked quite closely with a guy called Jude Pullin. He's done quite a lot with us on Design Spark. He's been on various uh, engineering things and on the TV and things. And the idea was is that we wanted to create inspirational projects based around this kit that would connect to other physical devices, if you like, uh, to inspire yeah. people to create hardware to add on. So I think probably the best example uh, is Jude's to sort of start with is the canary in the coal mine kind of idea right so we all know back in the Victorian days they used to take canaries down into coal mines to see whether there was any toxic gases down there that would kill the miners yeah. and so the canary you know it would detect it obviously would would keel over on the perch so the idea behind that was uh, we were looking at co2 actually for this canary so the co2 canary it was called at one point or the covid canary at another point as well because one of the things with co2 you've got too much co2 in a room uh, like in a school classroom for example which was quite big in the news back in the sort of the pandemic times is if there's a lot of co2 in the room covid particles can't float near the floor right so you're more likely to pick up and breathe in covid particles if there's you know dense co2 levels in the room so what we decided to do or do design this this canary which basically connected to the ESDK and the CO2 sensor. And as he sat in his office working, the CO2 started to climb. Right. So he'd get an early yeah. warning basically to say, hey, look, you know, the CO2 is climbing up. You need to do something about this. And you'd have been like a funny little voice, which I won't attempt to do on the video here, to say that, um, you know, that, 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 that it's getting a bit stuffy in here and can you open a window? And then if you don't open the window, he starts to get a bit more agitated and flapping on the perch and says, you better open the window, I'm going to pass out. And eventually he didn't open the window, you know, he kills over on the on the perch, right? So, and then when you finally open the window, it'll come back to life if you like. And, yeah. do that. So, and that can be applied to anything. Um, and that was using local data, uh, if you like. And then some of the other influences we work with, in fact, we've got some great ones from all over the world. With So Cecilia is another great example who created her Good Air Bear. Uh, she lives in North America, and uh, there's a lot of wildfires around where she is in the Washington State area, I believe. And so her actually uh, project is really cool because it doesn't just utilize the local data that's coming through and the local sensors, but it actually links on to APIs from the weather forecast as well. Okay, right? yeah. So in her case, her bear, or the good air bear, is, is will react based on the uh, the level of um, particular matter, right? So PM, and I can't remember which one it is for smoke and particles, but anyway, it's PM something, could be PM 2.5 or 10, whatever it might be. Uh, and then as soon as you start to detect those, then the bear starts to react and pointing at the level of the air quality. And... Um, but what's really clever is, is that actually you can have a pre-warning with her. So if it's connected to the API, it can actually warn you that that smoke is coming before the sensor actually itself detects it. So okay. you yeah, can yeah. detect yeah. it and then go, oh, I better close my windows now because within the next hour or so, there's going to be a whole load of smoke coming my way and it will just, you know, I don't want that in my house. So you close the windows. Um, and actually what we've done with Cecilia's projects uh, is a bit of a sideline. We've, we've, we've been working with the Maltese government in Malta and we put the um, the bears and CO2 sensors into schools uh, because um, in Europe, actually, and I didn't realize this until I went recently, in Malta is one of the most polluted countries in, in Europe. Uh, and okay. that's to do with the fact it's a small island which is overpopulated, there's overbuilding, um, they get dust storms from the Sahara, you know, the, the yeah. air quality is pretty bad, too many cars on the island. So they're quite worried about that. Uh, and it's like I think it's a death a day. Uh, I think gets put down to to poor air quality. Um, so we deployed these sensors into schools to help kids sort of understand the level of air quality of where they are, and obviously the parents and the faculty. But also we put the bears in to show them, you know, the state of their air. And at the same time, what we're trying to do is collect the data so that with the government can be lobbied to say, hey, right, okay, we know there's a problem around certain areas. We need to do something about it so we're not, you know, polluting the schools as much. Um, and try and solve that problem. 
So there was that. Yeah. And then other great example, I guess I'll pick on uh, what I think is a true activist engineering example. And we met Michael yesterday, as you know, when he came into up to Corby with his with his project. But the uh, Mindful Droid is a wonderful project idea. And Michael basically was very uh, taken by a, a new story that happened uh, a few years ago. A young girl called Ella. Uh, she's a London school girl. She was and she was the first person in the UK to have her her death put down to bad air quality and that was due to a, a massive asthma attack that she had and it was to do with the pollution levels around where she went to school and things which had triggered it so yeah. michael um really resonated with him he's got a young family himself and for him what he wanted to do was like how do i help you know make awareness of people about the air pollution being generated around schools and so he's created this wonderful little project called the mindful droid which can be worn or put on the dashboard of your car and if you're driving around, what it's trying to do is warn you that you're creating emissions. You should either take a different route or stay further away or not drive so fast because you're creating more emissions and stuff. So it's really a kind of a, an awareness thing. It's detecting and saying, look, this is the levels of pollution. You, you, know, you need to be aware that you're contributing to that. All right. And so it's an awareness thing, raising people all the time. A bit like when you see those speed limit signs that flash at you, if you're going a little bit too fast. So it's the same idea. It's just a so, oh, OK, right. I, I realise I probably shouldn't be here. I should move away or ease off the gas a bit. So, um, so that's a really absolutely nice project. So, that really yeah. true activist engineering project. That. I really do like what you're talking about with Malta, the schools, and also um, pulling in from other data sources in through APIs that you yeah. can then do some regional um, data analysis to to pre-warn. That, that's absolutely fantastic. So. You did mention also that you, you then extended out to the community. So you mentioned you've got 1.3 million users worldwide. So yeah. essentially what you're really there looking for potentially could be that data, which would help you paint a picture against all these different scenarios on a, a global level. Do you, is that the ultimate aim that you're going for? And what other things came from those beta users that, that were unusual, do you think? Yeah, so we gave um, 50 kits out to the community, as I said earlier, and we had some really cool projects back, actually. Uh, one of the ones I guess to sort of, sort of pick up on was uh, one that we had around NFT art. So how air quality can draw, you know, art based on, you know, the data that's coming through. Uh, and that was quite interesting. Uh, we also had some entries from Hackspaces as well, uh, who were, you know, monitoring their, their environment. Again, we spoke about that a bit earlier. Uh, and, you know, general people putting them in you know, various locations and realizing actually how bad the air quality is where they're, they're living and working and, and, you know, sharing their stories and data back on that. So it was quite insightful actually to see that and actually see the community engage with us. Yeah, I guess the, the message I'm sensing under this is it's the way in which the data can be interpreted and the way in which the individual person can interact with that data. So, for example, if you're using digital art as NFT to get a message across about the environment, that may be um, easy to interact with rather than taking a whole set of data and maybe some meaningless um, points within that data if you are not like a, a data scientist or you're not an environmentalist. Yeah. But in terms of looking at the physical aspect of the output as in digital art or your Breathe Better Bear, the person can interact with their environment and understand it a lot a lot quicker and a lot simpler, I suppose. I think so. I think this is where, you know, having people create, you know, add-on things to the project that, that that give a physical, you know, view of the quality of the air data, you know, it, it makes it really, really interesting. And, you know, and, and some of the other alpha projects we had as well, you know, were great examples of that. And then we had one around a passive smoking necklace that if you were, you know, standing outside a bar or a pub, uh, and, you know, it detected smoke from, you know, somebody smoking, you know, you know that it would glow and you, you can walk away uh, to, you know, general sort of, you know, sleeping at home and opening the window based on the air quality to exchange the air. And and also, you know, um, there was the one that we had in from Nigeria, um, which was uh, an amazing project from Ahmed uh, to, to sort of, you know, monitor the local air quality and build up a map of that so the community could see that. And, yeah, that's a very sort of community activist type of thing to do. And what was really great, actually, is some of these projects um, evolved and kind of ended up winning awards in, in various places. Um, and we also had, um, I guess, I think the first award I was aware of, there was a young lady called um, Avi. And Avi is part of the Girls into Coding movement. And Avi created this really nice project called the 
Um, it was a pavilion, basically like a particle pavilion. And that was about how, again, you can detect air quality in public places. So she built obviously a scale model, but that could be adopted into, you know, into a mm-hmm. much larger building. Uh, and her project and uh, Amo's project for Nigeria and Jude's project, I think, for the Canary and, um, you know, were all projects that kind of uh, actually won some awards in various different places across the Internet. Um, so Hackaday, I think, was one. Uh, so that was really quite exciting to see actually how those projects had you know been received by other communities as well so um so yeah right. that, that was really cool sounds like you guys are uh, got a lot to do um you've done a lot um yeah. already um pete just thanks for your time today and and thanks for giving an update on all of these great projects that you guys are are working on you're welcome <laughs>